my pleasure to introduce Avishi Padei and Swagat. Uh, they will be presenting about video encoding, high performance video encoding on the Kepler architecture. So, Abhijit has been leading the video GPU multimedia team for the past two, two and a half years, and his team is responsible for supporting the multimedia functionality in the video GPU driver for Windows. And Swagat is a senior engineer in Abhijit's team. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Alejandro. All right. Uh, so I'm going to talk about today myself and Swagat actually here. I'm going to talk about uh, Nvidia's uh, GPU video encoding, GPU-based video encoding technology that Nvidia introduced in uh, Kepler generation of GPUs. Uh, so until Kepler, we had uh, there were several encoding technologies, uh, mostly CPU-based as well as uh, you know some CUDA-based encoder architectures for there. Uh, Nvidia used to support CUDA-based uh, in, uh, encoder as well. Uh, so we continue to support that uh, to a certain extent, but going forward, uh, India is uh, promoting this uh, GPU-based video encoding. So I will go through it, uh, why GPU video encoding basics of what our hardware and uh, software architecture looks like. So uh, I will briefly go through why why you want to encode on GPU, right? Um, there are several reasons why you want to do that. Uh, so I will go through it, uh, followed by uh, a couple of uh, video encoding solutions uh, that NVIDIA provides, uh, CUDA-based as well as uh, the hardware, uh, new Kepler hardware based. Uh, most of the rest of the talk is uh, focused on the hardware based uh, encoding, uh, which is the Kepler and uh, the Kepler chip hardware encoder, uh, because the CUDA encoder uh, is, a, is a old technology and it's already well supported and well documented everywhere. So um, I talk about uh, our uh, hardware architecture as well as software architecture, so that will uh, explain a little bit more. Uh, and then we'll go through uh, some performance numbers and some, you know, a couple of quick videos uh, where we have encoded, uh, you know, some videos, video clips. Okay. Uh, just before I start, uh, one of the things that I wanted to uh, make sure that you guys, you guys must be aware of it. But uh, in last few days, we announced uh, in, in Jensen's keynote speech as well as uh, several other announcements, we announced the VCA, right, uh, the Visual Computing Appliance. Uh, there are a lot of uh, cloud uh, gaming interests that is. A lot of cloud gaming companies that are popping up. You must have seen it in the, the exhibit floors. Uh, so a lot at, at the heart of all of these technologies is video encoder, and you know, that's basically what uh, I'm going to talk about today. So just to clear the stage, right? So that is one aspect of the applications, various applications, I mean, one of the major use cases. The second use case, which might be of interest to many people here, is um, standalone video encoding. So that means you want to just transcode. High, high density, high performance transcoding from one format to another. Or it could be just video editing, or it could be just uh, something like archiving or compression or uh, defense applications. So there are a lot of applications related to, which is not related to uh, remoting or cloud applications or things like that. So, uh, so I, I'll try to uh, lay out, uh, there, are, there are a couple of ways of in the software to access both of these use cases, these both distinct types of use cases. Um, so there, is a, there are a couple of slides in the later part of the presentation which clearly mark that. So if you have any questions, please feel free to ask me you know, during the presentation or after the presentation. I'd be happy to answer those. But I just want to make, make sure that everyone understands there are a few different technologies that I will, we will be presenting today and uh, you know, uh, it might be a little uh, uh, <coughs> uh, confusing. So anyway, why GPU video encoding? Uh, so it's pretty, it's pretty well known fact that uh, you can do video encoding on CPU. I mean, up until maybe 8, 10 years ago, it may not have been possible. Uh, CPUs were not that powerful. But there are uh, open source implementations of uh, H.264 um, and even other, other codecs uh, for video encoding. And they, they work pretty good. So why, why would you want to do that, right? Um, uh, the biggest biggest bang for the buck, on whatever, you, you, you get the biggest benefit as low power. Uh, so on the CPU, it is, a lot, a lot of instructions, there are a lot of memory transfers, so you, you, want, you want to make sure that it's low power. So fixed function hardware is always going to beat in terms of power from, you know, compared to CPU. Uh, reduced memory transfers, of course I talked about it. Uh, low latency, so low latency is, uh, I'll, I'll explain it a little bit later in this second slide, but that is that comes inherently because you don't have to have many memory transfers. 
Uh, high performance is because you, you just have, can have many transistors or many, you know, many hardware blocks doing things at a very high speed as compared to the CPU. CPU, you are still limited by your memory bandwidth, your uh, PCI bandwidth, or you know, just the raw CPU speed or CPU architecture. So here, you can have your own hardware, which, which is high performance hardware. Uh, a combination of all of this is higher density. You can achieve much more density, much larger. On, in fact, I put this uh, over here, uh, almost double channel density as compared to the uh, you know, CPU, uh, standard, you know, standard Intel CPU, at much, much lower power consumption. This is just a, you know, a basic, uh, basic fact. Um, and the uh, other, the last thing is scalability. So scalability, what, what, what I mean by scalability, I'll, I'll cover it in the next couple of slides, but uh, you can just keep adding, if you want to scale linearly with respect to, uh, for just encoding, you can just keep adding GPUs without having to, you know, buy entire systems or entire motherboards with multiple CPUs, right? Uh, so, to, to illustrate this point, I wanted to go through uh, one use case, a technical use case, which, again, uh, which is related to cloud streaming, uh, which you must have heard today quite a bit about. Uh, in, in the last few days, there is a lot of discussion about that. So, I wanted to discuss about it, how it works, and how, where does uh, GPU video encode fix in, in the pipeline. So, here you have an app, uh, which is uh, doing uh, some, some processing uh, using DirectX or OpenGL or whatever it might be. So, there are textures and vertices in the system memory, the application actually creates that. Then it transfers those into video memory. Uh, and from this point onward, all of the, uh, the next three blocks are happening in GPU. So, then that GPU actually is rendering and presenting, uh, basically taking those textures and uh, various uh, vertices and making a scene out of it. Uh, for a game, it might be a scene for a, for a professional application it might be just a you know dead model or something. And then uh, that that image is actually being captured in the <coughs> memory uh, through whatever means either through Windows or Linux APIs or we have our own framework at NVIDIA which, uh, which is the uh, proprietary API. And if you want to do the encoding on the CPU at that point you want to have you, you, should, you need to have this image transferred into the system memory back because the CPU is just going to get you know working on the uh, system memory image. So that's where there's a lot of problem. Uh, and then you encode and then you packetize and transmit. So that's that's the typical pipeline. So what's the, where's, the, where's the problem? So transferring to system memory, right? Uh, that's That gives up a lot of bandwidth. Uh, it's just power, it's latency, there's a, you know, it, that's a bottleneck. In a lot of high density application, that's a bottleneck. Uh, the other problem is the encode itself. Uh, encode is also a lot of power. It's a very CPU intensive task, and if you want to do that on CPU, it's going to eat up a lot of power. And again, you're going to be limited by the CPU's uh, capabilities. Uh, again, the CPU intensive task, uh, it takes your cost per seat up, uh, channel density down, it's pretty obvious. Uh, and finally, uh, scalability. Right? If you want to have many, many sessions, many, many encodes running simultaneously, you need to in, in, replicate the entire setup the entire setup just replicated you know, and then running multiple applications simultaneously and CPU is this, this in, in such uh, you know, use case, case, this is where the bottom is the transfer, transferring the images to the system memory and the encoding. So uh, obviously the solution uh, we want to, you know, so we, we saw that these are the two problems, right? These are the two blocks where the problem is, uh, you know, concentrated. So what do we do? This is this is the solution. I mean, this is what basically we are talking about, right? Uh, you uh, you just get rid of the transfer to the system memory, and you directly transfer the captured image to the encoder, to the, to the encoder and to the encoding directly. So that's where you know, all, all these benefits are coming from. So low power, low latency, naturally, no large memory transfers. Uh, so the low power is basically you are using CPU only when needed, uh, and you are using quick fixed function hardware, which is NVMe-like hardware, which is very low low power. Uh, high performance low power hardware. Uh, eventually driving your cost per seat down uh, or cost of channel density up, uh, however we want to uh, look at it. Uh, the final benefit is again scalability, right? You can just add multiple GPUs. In fact, uh, you might you might have seen uh, in our several of the product announcements <coughs> that you can add up to 12 GPUs or up to even 16 GPUs in certain cases where you just, you know, there is this six, there are a couple of CPUs, very high performance for serial tasks and for video encoding or for any similar task, there is, you can add just a bunch of GPUs and overall system cost is much lower in such situations. So uh, that is where the benefit is actually coming, coming, <coughs> coming from. So excellent scalability. So, uh, okay, so what, what do we have in terms of, uh, what does NVIDIA provide in terms of video encoding solutions? So, uh, just to be clear, I, when I'm talking about video encoding here, the 
most, I should have made it clear, it is mostly focused on HDR264. So all the technologies that NVIDIA is providing related to video encoding are for HDR264. We do not support any other codecs at this point. So uh, what are the solutions that we have? Uh, two things, uh, two parallel technologies that we are supporting. Uh, this is the old uh, NVIDIA CUDA-based encoder uh, that you, you guys must might be aware of, which is uh, in, in the, it's, it's available as a part of the CUDA SDK as well as, uh, uh, you know, it is, it's, there's an API which is documented in the CUDA SDK and you can you get it when you, when you download the CUDA SDK. And this is a new uh, Kepler-based architecture, uh, NVIDIA. Uh, going forward, I'll, I'll refer to this as NBA, that's the internal and external marketing name that we are using for this hardware. So this is the fixed function hardware that uh, NVIDIA introduced as part of the other architecture. Uh, so just to lay out the differences, uh, CUDA-based encoder hybrid processing is CPU plus CUDA. Uh, some, some processing is done on CPU, like uh, VLE is done on CPU, is a high, highly serial task, uh, variable length encoding. Uh, whereas uh, motion estimation, intra prediction, mode decision, and some other uh, functions are done in CUDA, those, are, uh, those can be parallelized to a large extent. On the on the NVI, it's a fully hardware as accelerated engine. There is uh, nothing in software. There, is, there are some pieces in software, I'll, I'll speak about it further, we can talk about it. But uh, it's basically fully ex hardware accelerated uh, fixed function pipeline. Everything, including uh, motion estimation, <coughs> prediction, mode decision, VLE, everything is in hardware. Uh, because of the nature of the solutions, uh, the performance naturally scales with the number of CUDA cores on this, uh, whereas the, you know, it's already high performance, NBA is actually already high performance, but so what, what I mean by here is if you get a, get a GPU which has higher number of CUDA cores, for example, the performance will scale up here, so you will get higher performance, whereas if you, this is independent of number of CUDA cores. So if you get a GQ110 or a GQ104, uh, the NVA engine that is on these two chips is exactly identical. Uh, so that, that way, you know, I mean, it's, it's already supports high performance, it's a high, high density, you know, uh, engine. So uh, the, there is no scalability in terms of performance here directly. But the performance is already higher, I'll talk about it a little bit later, but the performance is already higher in, than the code in most cases. Uh, other thing is, uh, this works on all GPUs, uh, again that's one of the things uh, because NVA was introduced in Ke Kepler, so again this is only Kepler plus Kepler and future GPUs, so Maxwell and Volta will continue to support uh, NVA. Uh, what are some other differences? Uh, so in terms of software, but the CUDA libraries are distributed with CUDA SDK, uh, CUDA SDK libraries, uh, whereas this one is a proprietary software API that we are uh, making it available. I, I, I have, a, I have a link in the end of this uh, presentation where you can get it. Uh, there is, the, one of the things that we have optimized NVI is low latency streaming. So for applications like again, uh, uh, VCA or cloud gaming or uh, remoting, that kind of application. So this is it's extremely optimized for uh, low latency applications, whereas there is not, not a whole lot of work that has gone on in the, on the CUDA encoder for low latency streaming. Uh, the visual quality, in terms of visual quality also, uh, NVA is much better. Uh, we, we get much uh, much high, higher fidelity as well as uh, in terms of PSNR, SCL, there's a lot of quality plus uh, that you see objective as well as subjective. Uh, one of the differences is CUDA, by nature, CUDA is supported on all platforms, so the CUDA encoder is actually going to work on all platforms, GeForce, Quadro, Test Fan, right? Whereas uh, NVA is, uh, the API is restricted at this point only on Quadro, uh, and this is Windows only and this is supporting both Windows and Linux. So uh, roughly the differences, uh, I just laid out the differences, you can probably go through the slide. <coughs> but what I wanted to uh, highlight is, uh, this is this is an old technology that we continue to support, um, but all the new developments are going to be here. So again, I, I'm, I'm going to focus most of the talk, most of the talk on NVIDIA uh, and the rest of the, rest of the <coughs> presentation. So this is just a, a graph. Uh, I, but what I was saying is the performance scales with the number of CUDA cores, right? So what I was saying is CUDA, CUDA M4 or GK104, which has a large number of CUDA cores, uh, is going to be more than uh, the performance of CUDA encoder on GK107, which has a relatively low number of cores. So on the x-axis is performance, the number of simultaneous sessions that you can have, number of simultaneous HD and video encodes, and this is actually power. So at a relatively uh, 
Go through the main hardware architecture. Okay, 
So this is like the basic block diagram of our Envic hardware architecture. And uh, the, the yellow block here is our, the front end of our uh, encoder. Basically, we run our rate control algorithm as well as it uh, and, uh, programs the entire uh, and make uh, some modules which are below it. And uh, it, uh, it runs a proprietary firmware and basically it handles all interrupts and handles context switch and basically uh, it makes, uh, adds more flexibility to encoding like it can, you can change co encoding config parameters at various slice levels at value micro block level. So the, uh, the help of the microcontroller, we can do that. So that, that's the front end of our uh, engine. And next slide, uh, so motion estimation uh, unit. Uh, this is used to do the motion estimation. It runs the entire full fill search, as well as it does refinement on the full fill winner. And uh, we use uh, uh, just yeah, we don't have a, uh, we just use the exhaustive full fill search to do, find the uh, best matching block. But uh, we have an advantage that uh, NVN, you can run motion estimation on CUDA and provide external predictors and we can take that and you uh, just refine it and use it uh, or just do the scoring on that. So it takes various predictors like temporal predictors from past uh, winners special predictors like from neighboring macro blocks, o log for uh, direct mode, and it can take a group for global motion constant predictors, and external is like you can run uh, ME on like, you can run a CUDA kernel and do find the motion estimate, or like find the motion and provide the predictor to the engine, and it can, it can bypass the full bell search and just do refinement and scoring on those. and. Uh, and it finally also provides the predicted pixels for modification, like the for, uh, for for foundation and DCT also. The next sorry. The next unit uh, is the modification unit. It basically is for the, it calculates the winner final like it uh, it goes through the all all the winners predict the winners uh, forwarded by the motion estimation unit for each partition. And it finds the winner inter they calculates the inter MB cost for each partition and decides which is the winner inter partition. And then basically come and it uh, it, it doesn't does the intra search, but it uh, uh, basically instructs the other module to do the intra search and takes a final IP decision to find whether the macro block can be coded as a intra or a p macro block. So. So this, this unit is basically responsible for the intra search uh, and uh, it, uh, after the modification has been completed, if it is a, uh, it's a intra winner or a, uh, it's an inter winner, we accordingly provide, it calculates the residual and does the forward DCT and quantization on it and also runs the recon loop and does the deblocking and the final unit here is the, sorry, uh, the VLE unit which is uh, basically running CABAC and CABLC uh, and uh, basically it uh, provides various uh, like stacks also <coughs> like uh, bit count, SATD uh, for rate control, uh, to run rate control on the microcontroller and uh, the, this is the just the memory interface for the unit. Why would you use uh, motion estimation predictors out of CUDA instead of the built-in ones? Is that for higher quality or better performance? Or yeah, you, it, it's possible that uh, you it, it, because our uh, algorithm is like just full search. If you have a better algorithm, memory algorithm, you can probably run it on CUDA. And uh, yeah, like uh, CUDA performance, like a very high in GPU. 
like you have a lot of cores, maybe it, uh, the, it outperforms the hardware ME in that, those cases. So you can run the motion estimation on CUDA and just bypass the full pell search completely. And so then you, maybe you could get more streams that way? Yeah. Okay. So I'll go over the software architecture. Okay, so this is like uh, mostly covering the transcoding and uh, direct encode. Uh, like it's not like capture, like the example of Jeep was showing cloud game. This is like just normal video editing, uh, transcoding uh, applications where you want to change the profile or change the resolution of the your uh, uh, file or basically change the bit rate or change the frame rate or you want to do some editing and. Uh, so this, this, these use cases, uh, although we, we are working on this and uh, we support transcoding uh, and we are working with a lot of uh, ISV customers to enable NVM for transcoding solutions. Uh, mostly it, we are still, like, uh, our, it's more fine tuned to a low latency streaming if you look at the SDK. But uh, our hardware obviously supports transcoding. Like you can do de uh, decoding on using the DXDA, proprietary DXDA, uh, Microsoft API and just do and use NVN because we provide an interop with D3D. So uh, we, uh, well, it's a low latency interop with D3D and you can do transcoding on NVN without any perf loss. Uh, and this is basically all the low latency, uh, like raw encode uh, scenarios like video conferencing, uh, cloud gaming, remote graphics, so, uh, and this is exposed to another SDK, the grid SDK, uh, and it uh, basically exposes a limit in number of encoders settings which are just, uh, just limited for fine, like, for, uh, just for streaming, and low latency streaming, so this is another, another grid SDK. Okay, this, uh, this is just an overview of the software architecture. So basically, uh, the client <coughs> application uh, layer is on, is on a, uh, in the user mode stack. So the client application, it, uh, basically you can initialize the encoder session, open an encoder using the NVENC SDK API, and then you can basically create an encoder with your settings, like whether you want to high profile, 264, and which mode decision parameters, and uh, what rate control CVR or uh, DVR, what uh, like like various other encoder settings, and basically that uh, that uh, on encoder API uh, takes uh, it uh, talks to an NVM driver, software driver, which is still in user mode, and the NVM driver interop is has interop capability with both CUDA and VX, so basically the application can do some. Uh, do some uh, like can map a CUDA buffer to an NVM buffer, or can map a DX surface uh, to an NVM buffer, and can just pass that handle, the NVM handle to our driver for encoding. So, and uh, this is the NVM hardware the, and with the firmware, uh, with the proprietary firmware running. So, this is the basic uh, software architecture. So, any question on it? So, uh, just to be clear here, um, one, one thing I wanted to actually clarify uh, for some of you uh, who may not have followed, there are two basically ways of uh, accessing the NVENC uh, hardware engine. One is the NVENC SDK uh, and the other one is the grid SDK. So, this slide is about NVENC SDK, which is a direct API or a direct uh, uh, programming interface for accessing the advanced encoding functionality uh, without having to go through any capture mechanism or a uh, uh, Similar, similar use cases. So this is for for, for use cases such as transcoding, video editing, or uh, archiving, or uh, you know direct video encode uh, like applications. This is the SDK that you would want to use. Um, and uh, again, all of this, all the, although this block diagram might look like complicated in terms of number of uh, you know units there, CUDA driver and NVM driver, all of that is completely hidden from the user uh, by our NVM API that you see at the top. So. From the application's point of view, all you see is a set of APIs that you are that you see here in, in VNC API, and those are the APIs to, to, you know which you get along with the SDK, and you just call them in a specified manner. 
to make sure that you, you, you get the video encoding uh, output that you want. Uh, so the next slide actually, uh, you can go to the next slide. Yes. This is the grid SDK, which the other SDK, which has the capture <coughs> capability as well as low latency encoding. So this uh, uh, this basically sorry this uh, it, it uses the, it's cap the capture stack is part of the DirectX driver. It uses to capture the output of your gaming uh, render target or your desktop and. Uh, it uh, converts it into YUV format, which any uh, hardware understands, and basically uh, then it programs uh, the driver to encode, and the encoded stream is handed over to, uh, to the, uh, the client application. So uh, the NVENC SDK is available at this uh, link, and it's a unified API for both Windows and Linux. It works on x86 and x platform and uh, various presets are available for transporting and low latency application and we support uh, CBR and VBR rate control. So advanced features, uh, these are mostly for low latency streaming, like we support dynamic resolution change, so you don't need to reinitialize the encoder because creating a hardware encoder context and like a GPU is a heavyweight operation, so we we do a seamless resolution change, uh, dynamic resolution change. You can do a dynamic bitrate change, and these as kind of uh, reference picture invalidation is kind of error recovery mechanism used for streaming, where you can invalidate reference frames which the client doesn't receive. Uh, you can uh, they, uh, they, we provide inter refresh capability in the NVENC SDK so that uh, it, instead of sending like large IDR frames. Uh, low latency streaming, you can just use interrupted, <coughs> which consume much less bits. And we have a two pass rate control for constant quality. It's optimized to like give like four uh, 720p uh, sessions per, per uh, uh, NVENC GPU. So it's you don't have to rerun the. It's not a, it, it has no look ahead. It just runs these first pass and does a first pass analysis it, to just have a better quality. Because uh, like lot of thing, a lot of uh, low bitrate streaming. If we don't have an initial estimate of the, uh, we don't do an initial analysis on the frame. We don't have a good initial QP. The, we see lot of banding effects at low bitrate. So it's kind of uh, like, uh, like recommended to use for low latency streaming. Uh, there is slight perk drop to single pass, but the quality benefit is much better. So the grid SDK, it's licensed from NVIDIA and uh, this is the grid SDK which has the capture stack along with the encode. So uh, it's also uh, available in Windows currently and Linux is coming in the future. It works on x86 and x64 platform. Uh, it provides various presets for low latency streaming for cloud gaming, remote desktop and like, kept, uh, like and uh, it is optimized uh, like this, the settings are like just the settings which are exposed are only for low latency through this SDK. So these are some NVN performance numbers. So one okay. second. Uh, so one of the things that I wanted to highlight here is uh, just to you know because there are two ways again I we are presenting two SDKs here separately. Uh, the, the, the predominant difference is if you want to use, uh, again as I said earlier, if you want to use it for pure video applications, transcoding, encoding, archiving, uh, video editing, you use the NVENC SDK. For capture and encode, low latency streaming, use the grid SDK, right? So that's the clear, you know, the, both, both of these things are optimized for specific use cases. Uh, because, uh, for example, for transcoding, you don't need to capture, and there are certain, uh, you know, certain set of uh, software APIs that you don't want to know. Uh, once you have exposed in that SDK. Whereas on the, on, the, on the capture and encode use case, you want to have a very easy way to just capture and send that uh, buffer to the encoder directly without having to do a lot of advanced processing on it. So there is some uh, use case differences and that's why the particular presets and particular settings are optimized in each of those cases. 
So these are just two ways of accessing the MBA. Uh, I just want to keep emphasizing that because it might sometimes, you know, there are, there are, which one is what, it might be a little bit confusing. That's why I, I, I keep coming in and telling this. So these are the uh, numbers uh, we got uh, on some of the clips on our current driver and, uh, and all are on 1080p and uh, like we have three gaming clips and one video clip and the HP preset is almost like uh, like 7 cross HD uh, and uh, the high quality preset is like it's a more than 4 it's more than 4 cross HD uh, and these are like uh, we, we support uh, hardware context switching and the context switch penalty is very low and you can uh, it supports more than actually it supports, it can support more than 10 contexts we haven't just shown in the graph. So you can use multiple, you use the same hardware to run multiple encode sessions. And this is, uh, uh, this is a, like a gaming sequence capture at uh, uh, like the, done at 7, uh, 5 MPS at 720p. Uh, and this is like, uh, so encoded using MVNC, low latency streaming at 5 Mbps and basically we it's uh, it's with our grid SDK settings and uh, this is at 10 Mbps call of duty so what, what you see at the bottom is actually the instantaneous bitrate uh, that is being uh, output by the by, for each of the frames so uh, so the the top line is the target, uh, which is 10 Mbps in this case, um, and the bottom is the actual bitrate um, that is also oh, sorry. Any question? Thank you. Okay. We have now time for questions. Wants to encode. 
all it's doing is it's just calling the NV API at the, the bottom. And so the NVAC API is actually, the, so in the, in the NVAC SDK, we are just taking the, the, the capture part out. We are taking the under the, the, the low level NVAC API and then exposing it directly. So from the compatibility point of view, yes, I mean the, the functionality that you get in both is same. The APIs are not one-to-one -one compatible because the use case is different. Uh, I mean, for example, on Grid SDK, there is a, there is a function which basically which says, okay, go capture and encode. It's a single function call. And then it, you, you program, there is a structure that you pass that you say, okay, these are the settings I want on encode. Whereas on, uh, on the, on the MVC API, there is probably a few other things that you have to do before you start encoding because there is, there is much more flexibility you, for, 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 for use cases like transcoding or video editing. You might want to tweak some parameters, quality settings, much more granularly than you want to do it for, for low latency. Uh, did I answer your question? Uh, yeah, uh, thanks for the answer. Um, what, what I'm looking at is uh, for a POC, should we straight start with the Creed SDK looking at uh, screening with a low latency, or we should actually try first uh, with the NVNC? Because the first time it's made available. Um, looking at it, looks like we should go straight to the Creed start doing the Creed SDK for development. Uh, so here's the thing, right? Um, Grid SDK is a licensed product. Okay, so I, I, I think that this was I should have made it clear. It was in the slide, but whereas NVAC SDK is available on the developer zone. I mean, the, pl the platforms are specific on which which works on which platform. There's a there's a there's a matrix for it. Uh, if your application or your use case is capture and streaming, a cloud application, cloud related product, you want to start with Grid SDK. But at that point, you you would you would there is no download link. I mean, there, that's why there was no download link for Grid SDK. It is actually a product that we, you know, uh, with which Nvidia licenses to uh, its customers or partners, right? So you would want to start with that for that application. Uh, if you want to have just encoding use case or transcoding use case, or you know, you want to build up uh, transcoding farm, right? Uh, mass transcoding farm, or you know, just. Uh, remote, uh, you know, a, a video encoding engine, which is high performance video encoding engine. You, you just start with an event SDK and that is available on our website, our developers on website. Make it clear? Is yeah. that clear? Okay. Uh, how does the encoder scale to uh, larger images? Larger images? Yeah, for uh, uh, 4MP, 8MP. What speed do you get out? Yeah, so obviously uh, because we, we use a full search algorithm for motion estimation, uh, <coughs> basically the, uh, the, it's basically the, if the number of microblocks per encode increases, the performance will increase. So uh, if you want to get the same performance as a low resolution, you basically have to uh, reduce the search range. And I'm guessing most of these, I think, motion estimation is the bottleneck in those cases. So. Of the performance decreases with the uh, resolution change. Uh, I don't have the exact numbers, like uh, like exactly at what ratio the performance decreases. But uh, we do support 4K cross 4K streaming at 30 FPS, like a reasonable quality. And uh, obviously the bandwidth will be much higher. But we do support 4K cross 4K streaming at uh, 30 FPS. So you can encode basically in 4K by 4K cross yeah. 4K at reasonably good quality at 30 FPS. And so you have to do it with the parameters. So uh, we search in motion images like kind of sometimes overkill. Can you limit that or uh, the hardware don't allow that? Yeah, currently the hardware does allow it. Kind of so there's no, I mean, yeah, there is no so full search in a 4K. No, we don't do full search. You can provide a search window. Ah, okay. Uh, ah, they, okay. They okay. Say, it's not okay. they, you, it says it's, it does exhaustive search within the full oh. window. Yeah, it's not a full search. But it still will, will search some pixels which could have been discarded. Uh, but I mean, although that is configurable, uh, it, it, is, it is a configurable parameter on the hardware. Uh, it is kind of abstracted from the software point of view, from the API point of view, it is abstracted from the uh, user and it is. Uh, it is available only through the presets. So we, we expose several presets uh, which, which essentially are set of 
parameters that are pre-tuned or fine-tuned for a particular use case and uh, for, for a particular use case and the resolution and you know specific uh, application. So the, the search range, although it is configurable, it is not a directly exposed parameter in the in the SDK. Um, so, but but there are there are several options in the within the presets that we provide that that you should be able to match with your use case and the reasonable performance that you want. Um, what would be uh, encoding latency for uh, when you are conferencing applications? And so, do you plan uh, support for uh, macOS? Okay, uh, the first question, um, what do you put with the encoding latency? So typically, again, as I said, uh, we it, it, it's a performance and quality trade-off, right? For video conferencing, I'm presuming the image is pretty much static. I mean, the video is it's a, it's a headshot, right? And uh, you don't have much larger moving background. So at a reasonable quality, you, you should be able to get, if you are, if you are looking for 1080p HD, HD video conferencing, you can easily get you know, five or six sessions at a reasonable quality. Uh, not a very great quality, but no, no, five or six simultaneous HD sessions. So it should be able to run about 150 to 170 frames per second if you want to encode, just do, do encoding. So if you, you can translate that to latency, right? So if you think about it, that one over that is probably what, uh, six or seven milliseconds is what the encode time is. Per, per frame, and you add your processing on top of it, whatever transfers, programming, the hardware, you can pipeline it, and you can certainly have write an application in a very intelligent way such that all of those latencies are hidden behind the rest of the processing. So the only only thing that shows up in the entire pipeline is the encoding latency. So, so there is a, there is a way to you know uh, write the application properly so that you, you can minimize latency. But in terms of actual processing time required for encoding. Should be in the range of six to seven milliseconds for a 1080p uh, frame, uh, at a reasonably good video conferencing quality. I mean, if you are looking for a you know very high quality video conferencing with a lot of you know I don't know why we do that, but you have some you know uh, external outdoor shot which you are video conferencing that might be a little bit tricky, but. Yeah, for surgical operations you definitely want a higher quality, uh, so you might actually need a little bit uh, you know, better quality uh, uh, encoding at that point. So latency with that might be a little high, you know, 12 to 15 millisecond range, because you want to start encoding, you want to encode that with much, much higher quality than you would want for a headshot video uh, conferencing. Sorry, yeah, uh, the second question was uh, support for Mac OS. We do not have it planned at this point, um, so it is purely supported on Windows and Linux only. There is no plans for that. Have you done any uh, comparison to X264 or other CPU-based uh, encoders in terms of compression, and quality, and performance? Uh, yes, uh, that's a good question. Uh, this question does come up a lot. Uh, yes, we have done comparison. Uh, unfortunately, I did not have the slides uh, uh, in this presentation, but there is, there has been, uh, there have been some, we have internally made several comparisons. Um, we are very competitive with X264 at, you know, uh, comparable uh, performance levels. So X264 is quite dynamic in rate, right? You can, you can, you can tweak a lot of parameters, quality and performance. You can actually just have it, uh, do everything at a very large search range and very, uh, you know, uh, very com computationally intensive uh, motion estimation and search algorithms, and as well as rate control. So there are many settings in H2, X264, open source uh, encoder. But at a at a equivalent quality, we are slightly better performance. Actually, in fact, I would say probably 50. You know, don't quote me here, but around 40 to 50 percent greater performance we should be able to get from X264. The biggest, the biggest uh, advantage here is you, if you, if you are using X264 at that performance, <coughs> you are just eating up the entire CPU. You, you don't have any CPU left, so you are just offloading. You are getting 50 per, almost 40, 50 percent more performance. You are offloading all of that thing on the GPU, and then your, your CPU is free to do whatever it needs to do. But yeah, you are right. In the, there is comparisons. It is uh, at a, we have especially our low latency streaming. That is where most of our focus has been for last several months. Is is very very competitive as compared to X264. Uh, so in fact, actually, um, on some of the uh, 
objective measures we hear much better than X264. Any other question? Okay, let's do one more. Uh, you can always ask me questions outside. I'll be here for some time on this session. For the video clips that you showed, to achieve that quality, uh, what was the record time for that? Uh, so for the clips that we showed, um, I believe uh, it was uh, 10 milliseconds. Yeah. 10 milliseconds for the it's running for about 100 frames per second. Yeah. So if you want to run three such, you know, four such uh, three games simultaneously, you should be able to do that. For the uh, transcoding shell, what was the decoder being used and how fast was that running? Uh, can you repeat the question? Decoder. For the transcoding, you, had a, you must have had a decoder running to transcode. What was the decoder and how fast was it running? Uh, so we have a decoder on chip. Uh, it's a, that has been around for the last couple of generations of chip. Uh, so th in this presentation, there was no decoder anywhere. I, mean, uh, I don't know if you're talking about specific slide or specific thing, but we have a decoder on the chip which can run around 4x HD performance. So that's about 120, 130 uh, frames per second decoding at, for HD. Uh, and that can decode anything, H264, PC1, uh, MPEG2, MPEG4. Does that answer the question? Yes. And another question, is the grid SDK virtualizable? Um, can you... Yes, it runs in a virtualized environment, if that's what we're going to ask. Yeah. Okay. Yes, and thanks to the speakers again. And Thank you for coming to GTC.